Namaste and welcome. Today, in our lecture series, we invite you to explore yoga and sleep. A lot of research has gone into it. Our world is plagued by emotional, physical, mental disturbances and the health of millions has been affected. Sleep cycles have been the first to become disrupted. Speaking about this is with us Dr. Sadbir Singh Khalsa. Now we're very happy to have him because he is a researcher in the field of mind-body medicine specializing in yoga therapy. Dr. Sadbir Singh Khalsa since 2006 has been an assistant professor of medicine at the Harvard Medical School. He's an associate neuroscientist in the division of sleep and circadian disorders at the Department of Medicine and Neurology at the Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston, Massachusetts. Let us listen to him and see just how much our sleep is important and how yoga can help as a therapy. Thank you for joining us. Hello, my name is Satbir Singh Khalsa. I'm an assistant professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School. And I want to thank the organizers of the Yoga for Unity and Wellbeing program for inviting me to give a lecture. The title of my presentation is The Science and Research on Yoga for Sleep. There are a number of important characteristics that need to be understood with regard to sleep. First of all, sleep is a biological need. All organisms on the planet have evolved in an environment of the day night cycle, and all mammals have a sleep need. In violation of this sleep need, there are consequences that will be paid if one does not get adequate good sleep. Another aspect of sleep that's important is that we need to consider wakefulness as the other part of sleep. Impairment in sleep, for example, will impair daytime wakefulness. So in the field of sleep disorders med medicine, the idea of wakefulness is an important construct. Another important feature is that sleep is a very active process. It's not a passive process in which things just shut down. There are many active processes taking place in the central nervous system during the sleep process. Finally, sleep is a very complex process. There's many different nuclei in the brain, many different neurotransmitters and biochemical changes that take place during the sleep process. There are a number of physiological determinants which determine the quality and depth of sleep and wakefulness. One of these is the biological time of day. All mammals and many organisms have a biological clock. In the humans, this is in the suprachiasmatic nucleus of the central nervous system. This biological clock is synchronized to the day-night cycle by light exposure. So if we try to sleep or stay awake at a time that is outside of the normal circadian phase, we will have problems either staying awake or trying to fall asleep. This is a problem that we often see with jet lag or with shift work. Another determinant of sleep depth and quality is the number of hours we've been awake. So typically we're awake for 16 hours and sleep for eight hours at night. If we're awake longer, our propensity for sleep is greater. And so this is called a homeostatic process in which the longer you've been awake, the more sleepy you are. There's also a cumulative effect in terms of sleep duration. So if you are continuously sleeping short hours, like six hours a night, for example, you will develop a cumulative sleep debt. And this debt will need to be repaid because this is a biological need. There's a complex relationship between the two main processes that determine sleep and wake. One of these is process H, which is the homeostatic drive. On the top of this figure, you can see the increase in the sleep load or the sleep propensity over the course of the 16 hours of the daytime in the yellow portion of this graph. On the bottom left is process C, which is the circadian biological clock process. Over the course of the 16 hours of the day, you can see that there's an increase in the amount of the alert promoting characteristics of the biological clock. 
However, these processes switch during the course of the night, pictured in the light blue part of this graph. Process H, the homeostatic drive, is discharged. Your sleep drive is discharged over the course of the eight hours of sleep. And then also, over the course of the night, the biological clock reduces its drive for alertness, allowing you to stay awake, stay asleep for the last part of the night. The complexity of the sleep process over a course of a single night is very marked. What you can see in this graph is that there are different stages of sleep. Awakening is at the top in this graph. REM sleep is this dreaming state of sleep where there's a very active behavior in the central nervous system. And then we have non-REM sleep, which occurs in different stages, one, two, three, and four, with three and four being the deep stages of sleep. And what you can see in this graph is the complex pattern of the way sleep is distributed over the course of the night. First of all, you can see that there's an alteration between REM sleep and non-REM sleep that occurs throughout the night. This is typically around a 90-minute cycle. The other thing you can see from this graph is that the majority of deep sleep in stages 3 and 4 occurs in the early half of the night, whereas the majority of REM sleep, the sleep that's associated with dreaming, occurs mostly during the last half of the night. The other thing that's indicated here is brief awakenings, which are very common to everyone in terms of their sleep quality. There are a number of ba major sleep problems that occur in three major categories. One of these is the parasomnias. These are very unusual sleep behaviors, things like nightmares or sleepwalking or sleep talking. The prevalence of these is fairly low. Another category is the disorders of excessive daytime sleepiness or self-restricted sleep. And we'll be talking about self-restricted sleep because this is one of the major issues within uh, the regulation of sleep in society. The third category is sleep disturbance or insomnia. This is difficulty falling or staying asleep over the course of the night. And if it becomes severe, it can be really a clinical condition called chronic insomnia. Let's address this first topic of self-restricted sleep. As I've mentioned, this is becoming a major problem in modern society. In terms of how much people need sleep, it is well recognized within the sleep research community that adults need typically seven or more hours a night, with adolescents and children needing much more sleep. In fact, there is recommendations from a joint consensus statement from the American Academy of Sleep Medicine. They indicate that adults should sleep seven or more hours per night on a regular basis to promote optimal health. Importantly, sleeping less than seven hours per night on a regular basis is associated with adverse health outcomes, including weight gain and obesity, diabetes, hypertension, heart disease, and stroke, depression, and increased risk of death. It's also associated with impaired immune function, increased pain, impaired performance, increased errors, and greater risk of accidents. So really these are the consequences of not getting adequate sleep over the course of the night. Studies in the United States have shown that the amount of time that people are getting sleep over the course of the night is actually reducing over time. Although the majority of individuals are getting the adequate seven to eight hours of sleep, what you can see in this graph is that up to 30% of individuals are sleeping less than six hours a night per average. And what you can also see in this graph is in white bars, these are statistics from 1985. And in 2012, what you can see is an increase from about 22 to 23 percent of individuals sleeping less than six hours in 1985, increasing to almost 30 percent of individuals getting inadequate sleep uh, in 2012. So this is a very alarming trend. And the sleep medicine research community is trying to educate the public about the importance of getting adequate sleep. Although these statistics are from the United States, there is recent evidence that this is also a problem in India. This is a report that noted 
that sleep duration, which should be nearly ideally eight hours per day in adults, is going down drastically across the world. India is in the bottom part of the list with average 6.55 hours of daily sleep duration. So if anything, the problem with sleep duration is even greater in India. There are definite consequences on cognitive functioning and performance. This was a research study that looked at individuals in the laboratory. These were healthy individuals. On the chart on the left-hand side, they had three different conditions for participants in the study. One was complete sleep deprivation. In the curve at the far left in the solid black squares, this is the increase in the number of performance lapses, cognitive lapses, when individuals were completely sleep deprived for two days, 48 hours of complete sleep deprivation. Other subjects in the study were in the lab for 14 days. One group slept for four hours per night for that entire time, and the other group slept for six hours per night. And what you can see is the increase in the cognitive dysfunction in the lapses in cognitive performance, such that after two weeks of sleeping four hours per night, the degree of cognitive impairment in the four hour per night group was as great as individuals who had been sleep, had been sleep deprived for 48 hours continuously. What's also important is the chart on the right hand side. This is the subjective experience of how sleepy these individuals felt. And what you can see is that in the black squares and the line that goes straight up, this is the perceived cognitive impairments, the sense of sleepiness in those individuals that were sleep deprived for 48 hours. However, what you can see in the curves of those individuals that were sleeping four to six hours per night, the degree of subjective sleepiness was not increased as much as it was in terms of cognitive impairment. What this means is that people who are chronically sleep deprived don't experience themselves as being that sleepy. However, their impairment is very severe. So this is a serious circumstance with chronic sleep deprivation in society because individuals are walking around very chronically impaired without awareness of this impairment. Another feature of sleep is its relationship to the regulation of immune function. This review paper showed that immune function is impaired with sleep deprivation and sleep disturbance. And this is mediated in part by the stress response systems, both the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis and the autonomic nervous system, leading on the, on the figure in the left to increase propensity for infectious diseases. Furthermore, um, sleep deprivation will also generate pro-inflammatory response, also mediated by the autonomic nervous system, leading to an increased propensity or risk for development of cardiovascular disease, cancer, uh, and major depressive disorder. An example of impairment in immune function is in this study that was conducted in the UK in military recruit trainees over a period of several months. What they found is that those individuals that were sleeping less than six hours per night on average had a substantial increase in the number of upper respiratory tract infections or cold infections over the course of that time compared to individuals that were sleeping six or more hours per night. This is direct evidence that sleep deprivation and inadequate sleep actually impairs immune functioning. Another potential role of short sleep duration or sleep self-restricted sleep is its effect on endocrine functioning, particularly on glucose regulation. This is a model showing the impact of short sleep duration and sleep fragmentation on glucose regulation. The bottom line is that this increases insulin resistance is a risk factor for obesity, 
and a risk factor for hypoglycemia and type 2 diabetes. An experimental example of this change was conducted in the laboratory. And what they found was that individuals who were sleeping four hours in bed on a regular basis over the course of the experiment um, showed an increase uh, in the expression of glucose and of insulin, um, and also in the increase in the decrease in one of the appetite hormones, leptin. Whereas those that were sleeping 12 hours in bed um, had much more normal levels of glucose, insulin, and leptin. In fact, we also see the change in glucose regulation with sleep deprivation as an impact on diabetes. And what you can see in this study is that sleep deprivation impacts the prevalence of diabetes. With under less than five hours of sleep, the odds ratio for diabetes is much higher. Another effect of self-restricted sleep and short sleep duration is its impact on nutrition and ultimately on eating behaviors. So short sleep duration has a number of behavioral factors that impact dietary intake, uh, eating behavior or intake behavior, and then in intake distribution and timing. All of these behaviors are behaviors that are prone to produce this condition of obesity. In this study, what we see is that average nightly sleep duration has a direct relationship to body mass index or weight levels, such as those individuals that are sleeping <clears throat> less than seven hours per night have a body mass index that is substantially higher than those that are sleeping seven hours or more per night. There's a complex interaction between chronic sleep deprivation that's driven by self-restricted sleep and these other physiologic behaviors. So for example, chronic sleep deprivation changes eating behavior and appetite such that there's a greater risk for obesity Obesity is a major risk factor for the development of a sleep disorder called sleep apnea, which is known to further enhance chronic sleep deprivation. Obesity is also a risk factor for the development of metabolic syndrome or type 2 diabetes. And chronic sleep deprivation has direct impact on glucose regulation and insulin resistance, which is also driving this risk for metabolic syndrome and type 2 diabetes. And then as I've mentioned, chronic sleep deprivation has a significant impairment or dysfunction process. And that includes cognitive performance, immune functioning, and autonomic functioning. The other major sleep problem that I'd like to address is insomnia. This is defined as the inability to fall asleep or stay asleep during the night, or even manifested as poor quality sleep. In America, the overall prevalence estimate of broadly defined insomnia is 23.6%. A quarter of the population suffers from broadly defined insomnia. And we know now that insomnia itself is associated with substantial decrements in perceived health. There are a number of criteria that tell us how severe the insomnia has to be to be clinically significant. This means a sleep onset latency or the time taken to fall asleep being typically more than 30 minutes a day. But the time awake after falling asleep is typically greater than 30 minutes or, and that the frequency of these is at least three times a week, that the duration is at least six months, and that the insomnia is also related to significant daytime impairment, such as irritability, or concentration problems. We can conceptualize um, the impacts on sleep from a variety of different factors. So starting from the bottom left, it is well known that psychological or psychiatric factors can impair sleep. This includes things like depression, anxiety, bereavement, or acute stress. 
There are also medical or neurologic factors, including things like pain, discomfort, and specific disorders that can impair sleep. Medications and substances also have a negative impact on sleep, whether this is acute use, chronic use, or withdrawal from medications or substances. On the top is circadian factors that we've mentioned, the biological clock. If the biological clock is not synchronized with the sleep-wake schedule, there can be problems. This can come from jet lag, shift work, or disorders such as advanced and delayed sleep phase syndromes. Environmental factors are well known to impair sleep. This includes things like physical discomfort, noise, and light. And finally, there are also primary sleep disorders, a number of which can actually manifest as insomnia. This includes disorders like restless leg syndrome, periodic leg movements, respiratory arousals, and parasomnias. Now, what often happens in many patients is that these sleep impairments are actually manifested ultimately in behavioral, psychophysiological, and conditioning factors which appear because of these secondary factors. These include things like fear, frustration with insomnia, sleep incompatible behaviors, and increased arousal if these driving factors continue over time. In fact, what can happen over a longer period of time is that these new factors will then themselves begin to impair sleep quality and manifest as insomnia. In fact, in many patients where the secondary factors on the periphery have disappeared and have waned with time, what the patient is left with is actually called chronic primary insomnia in which there are no secondary factors that are maintaining the insomnia. And the insomnia is maintained simply by these behavioral, psychophysiological, and conditioning factors. Insomnia is associated with a relationship with many different body functions. We know, as we've mentioned, that many different illnesses um, can impair sleep quality. Furthermore, insomnia is a risk factor for a number of medical illnesses. We know that insomnia reduces quality of life. It's associated with higher absenteeism at work. It's associated with increased accident risk, higher health care costs, and cognitive impairment. The primary treatment for secondary insomnia in which secondary factors are impairing the sleep quality is to address those issues. So for example, if the reason for the insomnia is due to pain, depression, anxiety, sleep disordered breathing, or another sleep disorder like restless leg syndrome, the strategy is to deal with that problem, treat that issue, and hope that the sleep problem goes away. In terms of treating primary insomnia, there are two strategies. One of these is pharmacological treatments, or sleeping pills, and the other is behavioral treatments. Unfortunately, pharmacological treatments do not treat really the underlying cause of the insomnia. And many of these pills will actually wane in terms of their efficacy over time. And in fact, many individuals will find that sleeping pills are no longer effective over a period of time. Behavioral treatments for insomnia are in conventional psychological approaches. And many of these are very effective. Sleep researchers and clinicians have developed what's called cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia, which incorporates a multi-component approach to the treatment of chronic insomnia. This includes very uh, benign strategies that are very effective that have no side effects. These include things like sleep hygiene, which are general sleep specific recommendations for facilitating sleep, stimulus control, uh, in which the association or reassociation of the bed or bedroom for sleep is encouraged. Cognitive behavioral therapy is used, which challenges dysfunctional beliefs and misperceptions about sleep and insomnia and helps with dysfunctional thinking during sleep. Sleep restriction improves sleep continuity by limiting time spent in bed. And relaxation training treatments employ cognitive and or somatic techniques to reduce tension and arousal. It's this last strategy which really has relevance in terms of the relevance and potential efficacy of yoga. Yoga has 
a number of basic elements that are manifested in the general population with respect to uh, yoga practice. These include not only the physical postures and exercises that you see here, but in traditional yoga, very importantly, the inclusion also of breathing techniques, deep relaxation practices, and meditative components. In fact, all four of these components have been demonstrated to some degree to have improvements in sleep. So yoga has the potential of being a very effective multi-component uh, intervention for the treatment of sleep problems and insomnia. This is a model of how we anticipate that yoga works in terms of its effects. As I mentioned, yoga is a multi-component practice of postures, breathing, relaxation, and meditation. On the physical level, on, in terms of fitness, it's improving a number of physical characteristics which am, may improve physical functioning and improve sleep. Self-regulation of stress and emotion can lead to improvements in resilience and equanimity, and stress is a major underlying factor in the features of chronic insomnia. Improvements in mind-body awareness, improving regulation of attention uh, and cognition and concentration and leading to metacognition can change our uh, self-regulation of our thought processes, which ultimately leads to metacognition, which is underlying cognitive behavioral therapy, an important um, therapy that's very effective uh, for sleep. Furthermore, these practices can ultimately also lead to these unitive deep transcendent states and improve one's sense of spirituality. Overall, because of this multi-component practice, we can see changes uh, in the bottom box in global human functionality, both on the gross level and to the deeper experience levels. We do have evidence that yoga practitioners do sleep better. In this study of long-term yoga practitioners, they applied a questionnaire called the Pittsburgh Sleep Quality Index, or the PSQI. Higher scores indicate higher levels of sleep disturbance. And what you can see in the control group is the mean value of 4.25 compared with a lower sleep disturbance value of 2.92 in the yoga group. We can also see this in the sleep quality and quality of life in the elderly. This is a study done in India looking at long-term practice in the elderly, comparing those that had practiced yoga for a long time with those that don't practice. Participants in the yoga group had a mean total sleep quality score of 3.771. Participants in the non-yoga group had a mean total sleep quality score of 8, which means more sleep disturbance, so that the scores in the yoga group were better than in the non-yoga group. The total PSQI score in the yoga group was below the cutoff level of five, which is considered a sleep impairment, and differed significantly from the total PSQI score of the non-yoga group participants. Furthermore, yoga group participants had significantly less sleeping disturbances, shorter sleep latency, and decreased use of sleep medications. Furthermore, subjective sleep quality and habitual sleep efficiency scores were significant significantly better in the yoga group than non-yoga group participants. Another study looked at the relationship between practice frequency and different characteristics. One of the characteristics that was changing was sleep disturbance. It was directly related to practice frequency of yoga. In other words, those yoga practitioners that had a higher intensity of practice frequency of yoga had lower sleep disturbance. Furthermore, yoga practitioners actually attribute improvements in their sleep to the yoga practice. So in this survey, long-term yoga practitioners, in response to the statements of my sleep is better because of yoga, or my energy level is, be is better because of yoga, strongly agreed with that statement. So 68% strongly agreed with my sleep is better because of yoga. 84% strongly agreed be that my energy level is better because of yoga. So this indicates that those that practice yoga actually attribute their improvement in sleep to the yoga practice. A number of prospective studies have also been done. 
This is a study that was done in the elderly in India. And the elderly are much more predisposed to sleep disturbance. In this study, in this randomized controlled trial, they gave yoga to the elderly and compared it with no treatment. And what you can see in the black bars, which is the yoga group in the top, this is sleep onset latency or the time taken to fall asleep. You can see that the black bars decrease by po post-treatment and are maintained at the long-term follow-up. Whereas the controls that did not practice yoga had no improvements in sleep onset time. The total sleep duration also increased in the yoga group, but there was no change in the control group in the bottom chart. We have also seen these kinds of improvements in studies that we've conducted with yoga. So in a study in which we conducted six weeks of yoga with education professionals, particularly teachers, we showed reductions in perceived stress at the end of the treatment, which were maintained at the follow-up, and also improvements in resilience to stress. And we know that stress is related to sleep quality. And what we saw also is this improvement in sleep quality, um, both at the end of the treatment, and which was maintained at the long-term follow-up. We've also seen this in post-traumatic stress disorder patients in a study we conducted of yoga for post-traumatic stress disorder. We indeed showed improvements in PTSD scores in the left chart showing that the black bars are reducing. This is the yoga group uh, reducing its severity of symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder. We also had the insomnia severity index in this population which measures the, the severity of the insomnia. And what we saw was a significant reduction in the severity of the insomnia uh, with the yoga intervention in this particular population. In a study in which we added both yoga and cognitive behavioral therapy for post-traumatic stress disorder patients, in the top right, you can see that we were successful in reducing the post-traumatic stress disorder uh, symptoms. But on the bottom charts, you can see the impact on sleep. On the bottom left is the Pittsburgh Sleep Quality Index score. You can see that the sleep disturbance is substantially reduced at the end of the program, which is maintained at the long-term follow-up. And when we compared the daily home practice that the individuals were practicing with the improvements in sleep, we can see a very clear trend, such that the, the more days per week that the subjects had practiced their yoga during the intervention, the higher the level of sleep quality was. We've also seen improvements in sleep in generalized anxiety disorder. And anxiety disorders such as trauma and generalized anxiety disorder are well associated with sleep problems. In this little research trial, we showed reductions in state and trait anxiety with the intervention, but also improvements in sleep disturbance. We've also conducted studies on yoga in public school settings. And in a qualitative study, sleep was one of the comments that was made by many of the students. These are examples of some of the quotes from that qualitative interview study. Some, one student said, yoga definitely helped with sleeping. It would take me a long time to get to sleep. When I was doing yoga, it was much easier to fall asleep and stay asleep. Another student said, I think I've been sleeping deeper and more comfortably because also along with the foot on the wall, I also do the three-part breathing so that I can relax myself before I try and fall asleep. And finally, one student said, yeah, I sleep a lot better, fall asleep faster. Now, the whole idea of yoga for chronic insomnia, the clinical condition of insomnia, is starting to gain momentum. This is a paper summarizing yoga as the next wave of therapeutic modalities for treatment of insomnia. And they argue that yoga practice is well suited to complement existing therapies and to address sleep problems in a more holistic way. Yoga teachers and practitioners have long touted the positive effects of yoga and meditation on sleep. Improvements in sleep are among the first and often most valued changes observed by new practitioners. Yoga is already one of the top five alternative medicine interventions for insomnia based on commuter and consumer surveys. 
This is a meta-analysis looking at a number of studies that have looked at sleep problems in women, and women are more likely to have difficulties with sleep. And what you can see in these forest plots uh, is improvements that favor the yoga group. In these black triangles you see in the top and bottom charts, they are on the side to the left of the vertical line, which favors the yoga outcome uh, in these studies. A clinical trial looking at postmenopausal women uh, who experience higher levels of chronic insomnia showed that yoga was able to reduce insomnia severity scores, uh, whereas the control condition was not able to do so. Finally, I'm going to share with you a clinical trial that we conducted using a daily yoga intervention over an eight-week period in chronic insomnia patient. This is an example of a patient in the study. And what you can see is each data point represents a day or one night's activity. And the first two weeks occur to the left of the vertical purple solid line. And what you can see in sleep onset latency in the top left graph is that all of the sleep onsets for this patient over the first two weeks were greater than 30 minutes with a high degree of variability. But what you can see over the course of the eight weeks is a general decline in the time taken to fall asleep, such as that the last two weeks um, of the intervention showed virtually less than 30 minutes to fall asleep. The vertical dashed line indicates the six-month follow-up. And so the two weeks at the end following that dashed line is six months later, and you can see that those improvements in sleep onset latency were maintained. You can also see improvements in total wake time in the, in the chart on the middle left, going from about five hours uh, of wake time down to less than two hours of wake time. Self-rated sleep quality on a scale of one to five, going from an average of about two to about four on the long-term follow-up. Also improvements in on top right on the number of awakenings. The total sleep time in the middle right chart shows improvements in average sleep duration of just about five hours uh, to close to seven hours, which is normative. And sleep efficiency, the percent of time asleep while in bed, uh, went from 50% uh, to over 80%, which is also normative. When we looked at the averages over all of the subjects in the trial, and this was a randomized controlled trial that compared a yoga intervention in the purple line with a sleep hygiene intervention, which is not a completely inactive intervention in the green line. And what you can see is the changes in sleep onset latency going down substantially from almost 50 minutes um, to less than 30 minutes on the long-term follow-up. On the bottom left, the total sleep time is going from less than six and a half hours a night to almost seven and a half hours per night, which is normative. And sleep efficiency on the top right going from less than 80% uh, to higher than 85%, reaching normative values. And finally, on the bottom right, the total wake time decreasing from just under two hours um, uh, to a lower level by the long-term follow-up. These results suggest that indeed yoga has a positive impact on the clinical condition of chronic insomnia. So I am supported by the International Association of Yoga Therapists, uh, which is an association based in the United States that accredits yoga therapy schools, certifies yoga therapists, and supports the Symposium on Yoga Research, which I coordinate. I also serve as the editor-in-chief of the International Journal of Yoga Therapy. I'm also supported by the Kundalini Research Institute, which supports the style of yoga that I practice, which is Kundalini Yoga, as taught by Yogi Bhajan. And finally, I'm also the director of yoga research for the Yoga Alliance. And my role in this organization is to promote research literacy. If you go on this free access website, you can find yoga research videos that have been professionally produced, many yoga research webinars that have summarized the research on yoga, including research that's been done on sleep and insomnia. And we've also curated a number of um, research citations on this web sub website that make this research easily accessible to everyone. So I thank you for your attention, uh, and again, I'm grateful for this opportunity to have presented uh, this lecture.